Hey guys, welcome back to Sandy Cuts. This is gonna be part two, the final part of the 35s video. So today my goal is to try to give you guys a blueprint of how to get to 35s on a GX or 34s or 35s on a foreigner. There's already a lot of videos out there, but I didn't see a lot of videos that'll tell you every single step from start to finish, which is gonna be you know, your suspension, your control arms, your adjusting your bump stops, and then getting to cutting and grinding and welding and so on. So I'm gonna to try to give you that blueprint and I'm also gonna address the cutting and grinding a lot because the videos that I see on YouTube, they're focusing on their vehicle. And the truth is that everybody's setup's different. The cutting and grinding that I gotta do is gonna be different than what you gotta do and what everybody else has to do because their setup's different, right? So my goal is to try to, guide, try to show you guys how to figure out exactly what steps you need to take for your vehicle, what you, know, what you need to do. And if you wanna just skip forward, to, you know, to the end, in essence, of this whole series and get to a point. The point is this. Once you install everything you need to install, you need to take your shocks off, you need to take your coils off, you need to jack up your tires, adjust your bump stops appropriately to where you want your vehicle to stop. Depending on the bump stops, give it an extra half an inch or so because they do, you know, they're squishy. And <clears throat> turn your tire left and right, see what you're hitting, cut and grind do the same thing over and over and over again and it could be 10 20 30 times that you're doing it once you're done with all that you need to go out drive your rig off-road possibly do a small jump um, try to get into every scenario that it can get into you will find more cutting and grinding that you need to do and you're going to come back do that and you're going to repeat that process on the gx i was lucky enough to only have to repeat that process once on the foreigner I'm still repeating the process, to be honest with you, um, and I'll show you in a second. The other thing I'll tell you is anybody that has 35s and that doesn't have, you know, wide body fenders or that doesn't have like an RCLT kit that pushes the axle forward, most likely if they're off-roading, they are going to be, um, you know, touching something with their tires. And this is an ongoing process. That's kind of the truth, that's the bottom line. There's no easy solution here. I wanna kind of get that out there. And that's not a big deal because if I'm you know, touching somewhere a little bit and I'll show you where I am, it's, it's not the end of the world. I just, but I do know that I need to come back eventually and fix it up. So that's where we're at. So I just want to give a quick tour of uh, my workspace here. This is a place uh, we rent out for the vehicles, a couple little projects we have. Don't really work on other people's rigs here, maybe once in a while for my friends, but that's about it. So this is my wife's foreigner, which right now is sitting at around 10,000 miles. After a bunch of trips this summer, we are rebuilding the front a little bit, and I am putting the gusseted spindles in, the tie rod sleeves, but primarily I took it apart because I want to work on the sway bar as well. So I don't want to get rid of the front sway bar on this because my wife r runs this and I want to keep it fairly close to stock in that sense. But I do want to extend it. So I'm going to be playing with these extendable sway bar links. And this <coughs> is all the trimming that we've done thus far. And as you can see, I'm not rubbing anywhere inside. I'm, I am rubbing here though. You can see the paint's gone here and here and here. So I'm gonna be cutting this like this today and I'm gonna be hammering that in further. It's a project that is forever. Surprisingly zero rubbing anywhere there. Very happy with it, no rubbing on top. That means my bump stops are set correctly. And the Southern style wings that I have over here, you will see that it has this little lip thing. I cut them basically. I was rubbing on the wings and I ended up cutting it up by about an inch and I am not rubbing anymore. I do have a little bit of paint flake so maybe I touched that corner once but I'm not concerned about that. Okay so this is the green foreigner on 37s which I will show you right now actually. I have the electrical system built here that is powered by you know, lithium battery, tank. It's gonna get wings on both sides. That one already had wings, I'm, I'm replacing them. Rebuilding the bumper. 
city rear LRA tank, Dana 60. So the backstory behind this rig while I show it off here is I was in the middle of this build. We ended up getting the GX and the white 4Runner almost at the same time. I switched to those builds because I figured they'd be faster and easier. And what ended up happening was with all the suspension tuning, tweaking, so on, all the testing and actually wanting to go wheel, so I ended up wheeling those rigs. This project has been on hold for close to a year. The GX is completely done. I'm not gonna be touching it for a year. That's a supercharger. I'm not gonna be touching it for another year because I'm really happy with it. Once I'm done with the foreigner in about a week, I should be really happy with that. So I don't need to touch it for another year. And my goal is to finish this rig by January at the latest. I'm like 80% done. It's gonna get two sets of shocks all around. That's the bumper for it. And then that's my Jeep that I've had since 2008. I wheel it really, really hard, brake it really, really hard. And then I don't touch it for two years because I don't want to touch it for a while, but it's time. That's a Dana 60 that's going to be going on this Jeep. And this is basically like a trail rig. And uh, one second kids. And uh, my goal is to get this rig out of the shop, back on the trails, fully rebuilt by the end of 2023. So here's the GX. I just want to show you the rubbing really fast. So I have zero rubbing really anywhere here, surprisingly. Um, I cut all that really well. You'll see it in the video in a second. Oh, it's hard to see here. There we go. And this, I heat gunned it and it, was, it, run, it wasn't rubbing. The plastic came out a little bit, so I'm either going to cut it or heat gun it again. But that's the only rubbing. I mean, that's nothing. And then the windshield washer fluid bottle. I don't know how well you can see. A little white over there. Right there. So it's barely touching once in a while. Um, I'm not concerned about it right now, to be honest with you, but that little bit of rubbing, eventually I may, if I rub all the way through, I'll replace this and throw it into the, under the hood. But for now, I'm probably gonna keep it like this until it goes bad. So I filmed this about eight months ago and I was still very, very new. I'm still very, very new, honestly, to filming. But eight months ago, I filmed this with the expectation that, you know, I'd wait a few months and post the video after I test the rigs out and make sure that everything I'm posting and discussing is actually going to work. At this point, it's been eight months. I wheeled both these rigs for at least 40 days each on trails. The four are probably 40 days. The Lexus probably closer to 30 days on trail. And I am confident, at least now, in what I'm saying. The problem is that during the course of those eight months, somehow the video files got corrupted. I lost the audio and some of the video. So I'm gonna be narrating this whole process. So I didn't follow my own advice from part one of this video series, which is to install your lift kit, put your tires back on, go get your alignment, drive around, let everything settle in, and then do your major trimming. I just wanna get everything done in one shot. And you can too. The downside of this is once you do all of this, you're gonna go get an alignment. It's gonna move your tires, your front tires, possibly forward by half an inch, maybe even more. And um, you're gonna have to trim again. But the truth is, most for most of you guys, after you do your test runs or jumps or whatever, you're gonna find more places to trim. So this is an ongoing process anyways. So first thing I'll say is if you decide to play around with your alignment, while you're doing this, which I did personally. Um, it's not something I recommend unless you really know what you're doing, but the SBC has some instructions on how to put the ball joints in based on the type of alignment you want. As far as the lower control arm bolts, the only thing I'll say is if you decide to play around with those, make sure you set your toe before you start driving because otherwise if you go too extreme with the lower control arm bolts, your toe is gonna be too extreme and you're gonna cup your tires on the way to the alignment shop. All right, so the first step is going to be to remove your front suspension, including your upper control arms. The steps are exactly the same for a GX and a 4Runner, except on a GX, on the driver's side, I had a notch under the hood by about a quarter inch to remove the upper control arm bolt. There's a ton of great YouTube videos on this, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. Once you remove everything, you're going to install your aftermarket upper control arm and connect the upper ball joint to the spindle. You're not going to put your shocks in. And once you do that, you put your tire back on the hub, jack your tire up as high as you possibly can go before you start causing damage to the upper fender. 
and then you're gonna move your tire left and right. I was able to do this on the GX by hand with on the foreigner I had to you know put the engine into start mode. But you're gonna move your tire left and right as much as you can and you're gonna find the first place you need to trim. Again, this is gonna be different for everybody because your offset and the width of your tire is gonna dictate how much trimming you're doing. For me, I had to trim on the outer fender of the GX, on the foreigner I didn't. So you do the trimming wherever you need to, you then put your tire back on, you do the same thing, do more trimming, and you keep repeating this process. And this process is gonna take hours and hours until your tires can go full lock, driver and passenger, without rubbing on anything. So now we're gonna get into the actual, you know, cutting part of this video. I'm gonna focus mostly on the GX here, simply because that's where I did all my recordings. Um, there's a great video that came out about a month ago by a guy named DBC Offroad that focused all the cutting and grinding on the foreigner and he, he did an excellent job to be honest with you. So for the foreigner guys, I recommend you watch that, but he only worked on the cutting and grinding part. Therefore, you're still gonna have to watch this video to understand the bump stops, moving the rear axle and so on. So the first thing you'll see is I cut the lip, the front lip of my front bumper. If your GX front bumper is extended, meaning it goes all the way down, then you might have to cut a little bit more. Then you start getting your tire back on, moving your tire forward, seeing what else is interfering, and you know, going from there. On the rear of the fender, I had to cut not a small section as you can see over here. It wasn't, it, it, it looks more extreme on video than it actually came out, so it came out really well, I'm happy with it. And you're gonna have to, and this works on a foreigner as well, you're gonna have to start going deep into that fender section and cutting off some of the metal tabs in that section. Once you're done with the tabs, this is what the final product should look like. Eventually that little plastic that's sticking out, I had to cut that off, but I tried to keep all the steel welds to keep the structural integrity. The welded tab on the left, I ended up bending that back to keep the weld intact. So basically use a 10 pound sledge bent that back, made everything nice and flush. You start opening up the plastic and you're gonna see um, a pinch seam. And that pinch seam goes all the way up. And basically you're gonna take your sledge and honestly, you really want a sledge here because it's gonna save you about an hour of banging. And you start folding that pinch seam in, trying not to open anything up. I have seen on Instagram photos of people that accidentally, you know, tore the steel somewhere slightly and that caused during rain flooding inside their rig and they couldn't figure out what that was for a long time. So if you end up opening it up a little bit or even just in case, what I end up doing is after I'm done with all this, um, I personally use like roofing silicone and I just throw a bunch of that on there to make sure that if there's any microscopic hole in the steel anywhere, it's all gonna get sealed up. So yeah, you keep banging and banging and banging and uh, eventually you're gonna get to the top part of that pinch seam. So you really wanna go up to where it stops curving, where it gets to the very upper portion and then you don't have to keep going to that pinch seam. So once you have all your rough cuts done, how you like them, I like to personally take a grinder and try to grind everything nice and straight so the lines look you know, as close to factory as they can. And once I'm done grinding everything, I'll take a sander, sand down everything I grinded, get it nice and smooth, and then throw some paint on it and I'm good to go. So the next step for me personally was to cut the CBI rock rails. They were too long for 35s. This is kind of why I recommend having all your armor and as much weight as you can before you get into all this because you might have to modify the products. I also had to modify my CBI front bumper slightly by cutting the tube a little bit. Not a big deal. This was more of a pain to deal with. And every single step you keep testing. 
keep moving your tires back and forth, seeing where new rub shows up. I'm gonna keep throwing this in the video because I'm really trying to press this. Um, this is, um, you gotta do this a lot throughout the process and it's very time consuming, but don't guess, make sure you have everything working right. Then comes the infamous body mount shop. You can use whatever you want to do these cuts. Uh, Sawzall, cutting disc. I use the plasma cutter that I bought on Amazon. It's actually my first time using it. These cuts don't have to be precise. If you don't know how to weld, not the end of the world, I would still do these cuts at home so you could finish all your trimming. And then you could drive to a welding shop or wherever and have them weld the plate on. There's plenty of guys that drive around for a year without putting that plate back on without any issues. So don't stress too much about it. I would go as aggressive as you can with this plate chop, um, meaning that you could always bend the plate, which is what I had to do on all these in all these scenarios. I did it with this specific plate, meaning a flat plate and not removing the entire body mount and installing a new body mount just for the ease of welding. And I had zero issues. After my alignment, I did touch the body mount slightly. And instead of rewelding it, I just beat it back with a sledge a little bit and I have zero issues with this setup. So once you weld it back on, you're gonna grind it ni down nice and smooth, paint it of course, and so on. I do recommend watching at least one or two YouTube videos specifically on installing body mount shops because there are some in good instructions out there. Be a little bit careful not to burn too much through the upper bushing. So if you are gonna be doing your own welding. So after the body mount chop, you're gonna put your tire back on and you're gonna make sure you're clearing that body mount and you're gonna start finding a new problem and that's gonna be the sheet metal on the back side of the fender. So your next step is going to be to take about a 20, 10 pound sledgehammer, maybe even a 20 pound if you could find one and you just start hammering right there. And you keep hammering and hammering and hammering, honestly. This process probably took me three plus hours on my first go around and after my test jumps, I came back and had to do two more hours of this stuff. It's, it was the worst part of this whole project, to be honest with you. Um, but you just keep going and going and going. And, but make sure you do not hammer too hard in the certain sections at the very bottom where the body mount is, just in case to not break that cheap metal open. Otherwise, go crazy. I mean, go as hard as you can. If you got buddies, this is where you call them to help. So once you're done with all the metal work, you're gonna start working with the plastic. Um, there's many ways to deal with this plastic and there's a ton of YouTube videos on it. I didn't do it the prettiest way because your goal is to heat up the, the plastic, don't heat it up too hot, which is what I'm doing, and then start slowly bending it back. If you want it to cool down faster, you could spray some water on it from like a Windex bottle. I heated it up too fast because I was trying to get this job done faster. And by heating it up too fast, you are gonna A, make it look a little uglier, and B, you're gonna possibly put some holes in the plastic, which I did. So if you wanna do it the right way, this will probably take you a couple of hours. Um, if you wanna do it my way, which is fast and ugly, it'll take you 20, 30 minutes. But either way, you heat up the plastic, you push it back, and you're done. With the front, you're gonna wanna find something to zip tie the front to. Um, if you have, if you don't have an aftermarket bumper, you're going to have to get creative and find some to zip tie to. I have an aftermarket bumper, so I made a steel bracket, L-shaped bracket, and I actually drilled my plastic to that L-shaped bracket. But again, you don't need to, there's the L-shaped bracket. You don't need to um, go as crazy as I did. You can literally just drill some holes in that plastic use some zip ties to push that plastic as far forward as you need to. So on the passenger side of your GX and 4 you're gonna have a windshield washer reservoir. Whether you touch it or not, is gonna be dependent on your specific setup, your offset, your wheel width, and so on. On my 4 I don't touch it at all, so it's a zero, a non-issue. On the GX, I had to cut the plastic to give myself that extra two millimeters or whatever of clearance. Spray painted the windshield washer reservoir bottle black. And now that I've been wheeling for eight plus months on this, I barely touched the bottom. So to me, it's not a concern. Eventually, if I rub through it, I will relocate it under my hood. There's kits out there. I know Expedition One and some other companies sell a kit 
But like I said, for now, it's not a concern for. And then you do more and more and more testing. Keep your, putting your tire back on the hub and keep testing. It becomes a pain, but I'm really trying to stress that this is the only way you're going to get as close to perfection as possible. So yeah, so I had, after the testing, I had to get the heat gun out again and start pushing the plastic more and more forward. Eventually, I got to where I needed to be where I'm not touching that plastic at all. So for the rear, um, once I was done melting all the plastic and doing whatever I needed to do to make sure I have the clearance, the bottom section of the plastic and the instructions for the BMC and in general, you're gonna have to cut that piece off. As you can see, it's already cut off here. So I needed to find a way to reattach it and keep it tight. You're gonna see me drilling in the metal tabs and I made those drills so I can keep those tabs nice and tight attached to each other on the GX at least. And then I also took zip ties and I was able to, using zip ties, get the plastic section of the fender to be pushed back as far as it can into the same tabs that I just made. So the last section that I had an issue with on the GX specifically was this LED housing that I'm pointing at. Where the white uh, connectors are, they're held on by a plastic bracket. And that was that specifically that one little section was interfering with my 35s. So I ended up taking off the wiring connectors, reconnecting them and just zip tying them behind the housing or in front of the housing, breaking off the plastic brackets that held that wiring connection in place. And that solved my clearance issues completely. Okay, so let's have a quick discussion on bump stops because the bump stop adjustments you're gonna be making right now are gonna have a direct, substantial direct impact on your trimming that you're gonna do. And it's gonna have a impact on your off-road capabilities. If you keep your stock bump, bump stop height with 35s, you're gonna get more up travel and that will give you, you know, more articulation when you're on rocks and it'll give you more absorption power when you are going really fast in the sand. However, it's gonna increase the trimming substantially. So when I mentioned 15 to 20 hours of trimming, you're probably talking now double that, if not more, and a lot more welding, a lot more work. Some people go through that process, some people don't. It's totally up to you. I decided not to because for me, the 35s, based on the type of off-roading we do, um, I, I needed the, the clearance, to be honest with you, more than substantial articulation. I'd love to have that articulation. Eventually, I'll probably go through that route of trimming as well. But for now, if you want to have 35s, limit your up travel by about an extra, by about an inch, maybe an inch and a half. This is going to be the guide for you. If you want to get more up travel out of it, this is still a guide for you, except you're going to be cutting into under your hood as well. So with bump stops, you have two options. You go with hydraulic bump stops like King and I'm pretty sure Fox and other companies offer them. Or you can go with the you know, rubber bump stops that are basically similar to factory. For the Forerunner, I went with King hydraulic bump stops. And for the GX, I went with Durabumps. I actually ordered like the Timbrin first, but I found the Durabumps easier to install. And the reason why I did that is because I really wanted to test out two different types of bump stops to see if the hydraulic ones are worth the extra price. So the hydraulic ones are way more difficult to install because they require welding. However, they are so much easier to adjust the exact height you want of the bump stops. Versus, you know, the dirt bumps are very, very much easier to install, but are much harder to adjust the height. So I'm just gonna tell you right now from an off-road perspective, I bought these rigs. I would say that the Dura bumps don't perform any worse than the hydraulic bump stops that I have at least, which come for the Forerunner from King, because they, only, they limit the PSI you could put in there. So from the performance perspective, I don't really see a big difference, and I don't think it's worth the extra cost. However, from an adjustability perspective, once you go to 35s, I think I still would prefer hydraulic, because I want to be able to you know, get the perfect amount of height that I require for my rig. So for me, I did not want to cut this section. I wanted to give the factory a look. Well, some people with 35s, they go up and they start cutting like this completely. That's totally up to you. 
Um, that wasn't my goal here, and I am basically limiting myself by about an inch of up travel, an inch and a half. If I start cutting in there, I'm gonna limit myself more. Keep in mind that if I had skinnier tires, less offset, I might actually be able to stuff my tire in there and get that inch of up travel without doing this modification as well. So that's totally up to you. I love this for now stock factory looking. Eventually with 35s, I may start cutting in here, but I'm not gonna do that for another year or so at least. In the rear, same thing. I had a notch here a little bit, but that's about it. Um, I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you, based on the way the rear axle travels, I don't think I can go any higher up anyways in the rear without having to start cutting this door, which is not an option for these two rigs. I'm going to do it on my green foreigner, but it's not an option for these, for this one on the GX. Okay, so for the front on the GX, I went to a millimeter from here. That was my goal. I don't want to start cutting this section upwards. I could start cutting this upwards if I really, really want to, but I haven't seen anybody do that on a GX to be honest with you, and I don't think it's that necessary because you actually gain more clearance because of the way the fender is shaped than a foreigner. So by cutting here without cutting substantially under the hood, I'm only gonna be gaining about half an inch of up travel, so I don't think it's necessary. So on the rear here, I could use have more up travel, and that is by cutting here. The problem is I am very, very close to the slip. I come with a tire back more because I have plenty of clearance here with the aftermarket bumper, but then my coil spring is going to start to not be straight, but it's going to go sideways. Therefore, I want, I'm pretty happy with the location where my axle is on the vehicle. So if I start cutting here and going more into up travel, I'm going to have to start cutting here, which means I'm cutting into the door. Keep in mind, because of the fenders that I have here, I'm already getting more off travel than on my Forerunner with the GX. So I'm pretty happy with it, but I do have space to go more if I want to. And this is kind of where the suspension height comes into play. If I had a taller suspension, I could squeeze out more up travel if I really needed to. But I feel I'm pretty, I'm sitting pretty well and I'm happy with where everything turned out. So if you have hydraulic bump stops, this is when you install them. Uh, weld them on and just adjust as just like the instructions here are if you have rubber type of bump stops you're going like i'm using dura bumps here you're going to remove the factory bump stop you're going to get your dura bumps you're going to get a longer bolt i just went to lowe's and picked one up that's the same thread and you're going to get a bunch of washers and the washers are going to help you adjust how low your bump stop sits i ended up using five washers to get myself about an inch away from the upper lip and the reason why it's an inch is because the bump stops are gonna compress when you send it. So you wanna make sure that you don't, you know, hurt that upper fender when you do send your rig. Once you finish all this stuff up, you're gonna start moving your tire left and right. For me personally, I found more issues for as far as rubbing is concerned. In the front, I had to move the rubber, uh, the plastic a little more. In the back, I had to do more banging. Um, but you keep going back, keep getting all the trimming done and then you're good to go. So once you're done with all your trimming that you wanna be done with, you get your aftermarket coilovers on, your gusseted spindles if you have them, your tie rod sleeves, your KDSS fixes, and you're done with the front. I wanna mention something else. You should not be rubbing at all at street height, at right height. You should not be running at all if you're at 50% between maximum up travel and ride height. If you're barely rubbing at maximum up travel, it's not the end of the world. You're already far ahead of 90% of the guys running 35s. Now we're gonna get to the rear. Um, the first thing I'll tell you is the rear is gonna be much, much easier than the front. And honestly, you can do the whole rear install in a day, even less. Um, some of the things I'm gonna be installing are gonna be optional. And I'll tell you the pros and cons of using them and it's something most likely you can do later on if you don't want to spend all the money on getting it done in one shot. So the first thing I installed was an adjustable pan hard bar bracket. Um, if you come from the Jeep world, this is a track bar bracket. And what happens is when you lift your vehicle, your pan hard bar raises and doesn't stay parallel with your axle. So by putting this bracket on, you allow your pan hard bar to get closer to 
factory, which is parallel with your axle, to allow your axle to move up and down better over bumps, off-road or on-road, instead of left and right, in essence. Is this something that is necessary? A lot of people go forever without these things, but nowadays, Dr. KDSS makes a bolt-on bracket which is a very fast install, much easier than what I had to do, which is well done. And it's fairly cheap for what you're getting. So I definitely recommend you get the bolt-on bracket and just be done with it. I also installed an adjustable rear pan hard bar. And I would say that I had to adjust my pan hard bar less than half an inch longer than factory. And that's not a big deal, to be honest with you. So you can easily get away for the life of your vehicle with keeping your factory pan hard bar and just using the bracket. The next thing I did was install rear upper and lower control arms. This will allow me to move my rear axle back for the 35s. You can stay with stock control arms. The problem is that if you don't move your rear axle back, your tire will hit it once you go too, too high up and up travel will hit the door inside the fender well, which can actually damage your door. So if you stay with stock control arms for now, that's totally fine. You're just gonna have to limit your up travel by about half an inch less up travel than what I have. If you do go with control arms, I went with upper and lower, not just lowers, because I wanna move my rear axle back, and I only ended up having to move it back by less than half an inch. But I wanna be able to move it back and keep my drive shaft angles close to factory to not overstress the drive shaft. If you do go with um, the lower control arms, I personally went with Metal Tech 4x4 simply because eventually if I get longer shocks in the rear and coils, I can turn it into a mid-travel kit pretty fast. So this is gonna apply only to the GX. On the passenger side, rear upper control arm, there was a strange bracket that took me a while to figure out what it is, welded onto it. It's for automatic headlight adjustments. So I ended up cutting it off and welding it onto my upper control arm in the same exact location that it was at before. And then I ended up also having to, you know, make sure my headlights are properly adjusted once I did all that. So the next step is gonna be the bump stops. After I adjusted my axle back and moved it back by about a little bit more than a quarter of an inch so I don't hit the door, I, uh, I just need to worry about the up and down movements. I tried Durabumps as you just saw. I tried Toy Tex, which I was holding in my hand and they were all too short. So I cut the Toy Tech in half, installed the Durabump on the Toy Tech and that gave me the length of bump stop that I needed to avoid hitting my upper portion of my fender. If you have hydraulic bump stops, you this would be much, much easier simply because they just you know adjust by screwing up or down. If you have less narrow tire, less wide tires than I have, or you have you know zero offset or something, you can you might be able to get away with having a slightly less length bump stop than I have because you'll be able to shove your tire further into the fender well. But the problem is with 35 you're gonna hit the door at that point. And you can move your axle further back than I did, but your coil isn't gonna be straight anymore. So the only real option to be able to shove your tire about an inch and a half or more than I am shoving it is by getting coilovers in the rear. Um, as you can see here, I gave myself about a, uh, an inch from the upper lip just because the bump stops are gonna have some cushion. So the final step is gonna to be to install your rear coils and your rear shocks. I used 898 ARB coils. I believe they're from ARB because I'm gonna get a rear bumper. When I get my LRA tank, Long Range America tank, I'm gonna put 899 coils. But coil is kind of a personal preference depending on your weight. The coils are a little bit longer than factory, so I needed to use compressors and the factory jack to get the axle down and that's because I have KDSS. Without KDSS it'd be a little bit easier to get everything in there. But that's pretty much it. You put the coils in and you put the shocks in. The other thing that I want to mention is I did not put steel braided brake lines in. I didn't file, find them a necessity right now. When I end up 
going to a mid-range travel kit here in the future sometime, that's when I will you know, deal with the brake lines. But yeah, that's pretty much everything for the install. Sorry again, this was kind of monotone and narrated. I really wanted this video to go different, but you know, I'm working with what I got. And unfortunately, I don't take a lot of photos when I'm off-roading. Um, I'm more into the heat of the moment than just wheel. But here are some photos of the rear flex. Again, they can go up higher in jumps, but you know, when you're standing stable on a rock, it's not gonna go up all the way. But this is pretty much what you get. You will see in one photo that on the rear mud flap, it does rub slightly. If I remove the mud flap, I wouldn't have an issue. However, I'm not too worried about that because I'm gonna be getting a rear bumper anyways. But again, if you don't get a rear bumper, you give her those mud flaps, you should not have any rub.